I am Global Business Development Manager for uh, Amazon SageMaker. Uh, being with AWS for two and a half years. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's it. Uh, let's talk about machine learning. So before I start, uh, just a quick show of hands. How many of you are data scientists? Oh, wow, quite a few. Data engineers? Cool, yeah, this is going to be interesting. So what we'll do is uh, we'll go through the slides, you know, and then uh, at the end we can take questions. If I can't answer because there are just too many topics, uh, then I'll definitely get back to you or connect you with the right engineers. Okay. So let's get started. So yeah, before we start, I just want to quickly, and I'm, I'm sure like you've heard about this stack in all your sessions. Most likely this is where we start, but just to level set, if someone has missed sessions earlier, then I'll just quickly run through this. So uh, when you think about machine learning in AWS, you think about the stack, right? So the bottom layer, we have three layers. Bottom layer is ML frameworks infrastructure layer. So in, this is a layer for uh, you know, researchers, folks from universities, and uh, folks who like to maybe tinker with the TensorFlow, uh, try to you know, accelerate the training on their own using AWS hardware. Um, so this, is, this layer is for those folks. Um, again, you can build your solution. I think uh, you just heard from uh, Arun. You know, if you were attending, you can use things like Qflow and others to use this layer. Uh, for these folks, we provide deep learning armies, which are pre-configured for different frameworks, as well as deep learning containers that you can utilize in different form factors depending on your use case. But a lot of these uh, customers using this layer typically use it for research, and they don't really put the stuff in production. Right? And this is where our ML services layer comes uh, into play. So ML services, we have uh, Amazon SageMaker, which is our end-to-end -end machine learning platform that lets you build, train, and deploy. Uh, we have added a lot of uh, new capabilities uh, a couple of weeks back at our, our reInvent 2019, which I'm going to talk about a little bit. And then, uh, if you are not a machine learning scientist or do not want to really train your own model, we have a lot of pre-trained uh, pre modalities available through our AI services. We call them AI services because it's, uh, it mimics human cognition, right? Speech, text, language, et cetera. And then we have other point solutions. Uh, I've just outside and talked to folks, and they're really excited about CodeGuru. <laughs> So, you know, CodeGuru is one of our new service. So again, focus is to uh, talk about training and inference. So I'm going to quickly jump onto the next slide. So before I go to training and inference, uh, I just want to quickly talk about SageMaker because it gives you a lot of the capabilities that I'm going to talk about for training and inference. So in SageMaker is a single end-to-end -end managed service uh, to build, train, and deploy your machine learning models in production. Uh, so the service uh, was launched in reInvent 2017, uh, added significant features, new features uh, in 18 and 19, and uh, we have added all the orange or yellow color things that you see, you know, blocks, those are added newly to Sage SageMaker, namely Studio, a single IDE, we have new type of notebooks, then uh, debugging capability for training, uh, there is a new job called processing, where you can do data pre-processing uh, pre before you start your machine learning model training. Then we have experiment management capability to track your thousands of experiments, uh, leaderboards, and then we have model monitoring capabilities. Now uh, we also have a autopilot, which is our auto, auto ML capability that allows you to just train your uh, regression or classification model without having to. Uh, really, you know, have a deeper knowledge about data science. But again, it is for both like developers who don't know data science, and it is also for data scientists because it gives you not just the model, but it also gives you candidate pipelines with different options of you know feature engineering. You can select the the ones that you like and then just execute it. It's sort of a white box um, uh, auto ML than any other uh, any other auto ML solutions in the market. Okay, so this quick overview, and now let's jump to training and inference, okay? The topic at heart. 
So before I go to training, uh, we run these experiments year on year. Like if you remember in 2018 reInvent, we had run an experiment where uh, we were able to train optimized TensorFlow uh, on 256 GPU instances with the ResNet 50 model. And we were able to bring down uh, the time to train significantly from 30 minutes to 14 point some minutes, or I guess 12 minutes. Uh, and we saw only 90% of uh, uh, what do you call the productivity scale uh, diminishing returns, right? Whereas if you use the stock TensorFlow, which is non-optimized, open source version, it was around 65%. So we ran a similar experiment with Mascar CNN uh, just to prove that you know, our hardware is still the, still the best. And uh, we are not just committed to MXNet, where you'll see a lot of our first party algorithms are built in MXNet, but we are equally committed to TensorFlow and PyTorch. Right? So we ran Mascar CNN, which is for you know, semantic segmentation model, on all three uh, type of uh, backends or frameworks. And uh, we were able to get significant improvement over the other vendor, which, uh, which is based in Mountain View, which I, I'm sure you guys can imagine. But then all those three uh, experiments had uh, significant improvements, right? Namely, PyTorch and MXNet were neck to neck, 20, 22%, whereas TensorFlow is 20%. So there is a blog post uh, around these results, and I really encourage you to check it out. And there's also a GitHub bucket. Okay. Now let's go to training. So, uh, so if you think about training, you know, training is something you always want to accelerate, right? So let's look at what are different options, or what are different form factors you have for training, and when do you use that you know, particular form factor, right? Like when I say form factor, it is instance type and instance size, okay? So uh, we have different instance families. So these are all the families that are in this block are available instance families for uh, training on SageMaker or you know, just on EC2 instances or deep learning containers. So typically, if you start from extreme left, the T family, right, which is the smallest type of instance. So these are burstable CPUs, right? So uh, not, I mean, these are good for hosting notebooks, right, where you're not really churning a lot of CPU, but, or like short jobs, right? Like I'm, I have a scikit-learn job that doesn't take long. Uh, you, you can use these instances. It'll save the, you a uh, lot of cost, because these are a lot cheaper than you know, M4 or other uh, instance, instance families. But again, uh, if you want to run long-running jobs, you know. Once you exhaust your credits, you know, these are burstable credits, you know, then you're sort of, it'll, it'll slow down significantly. So always use it for like small running jobs, but then you can, you can still use them. The next is uh, M family, general purpose, where you have a standard CPU to memory ratio, right? So we have this M5 to X large instance, 8V CPU and 32 memory, gig memory. Now these are, Instance types are best suited for machine learning models, which has that equilibrium between you know memory and CPU. Like they are not CPU heavy models, or you don't really need a lot of memory that you know that you are doing pre-processing, you are using for pre-processing your data during the training run. So when when you have that right balance in your models, then I would just use M class, right? And best way to sort of monitor these things are CloudWatch metrics where you can see like how you know, your memory and CPU is sort of uh, changing, how the ratio is uh, changing, and then you can switch between instance type for subsequent runs. So you can do certain job profiling. Now next family is R family, which is uh, memory optimized. So let's say you are doing uh, data prep using pandas in, during the training, right? Before you launch your uh, machine learning uh, training, uh, then you have to load that pandas data frame into the memory. Now, uh, the memory optimized instances, if you look at the ratio, R5 to X large, 8 vCPUs and 64 meg, meg, meg memory. Now, uh, gig memory. Now, these instances are good if you, have, you need a lot of memory and not as much as CPU, where you are doing a lot of data prep and you have to host things in memory. Next is uh, compute intensive C class of family or compute optimized. 
Uh, this is an instance where, uh, let's say, you are running <coughs> a model like uh, uh, DeepAR, or the, the models that are, that are very compute intensive, right? but they do not require as much of memory to hold data in, in the memory. Right? So that's where you use compute optimize. And if you look at uh, some of the models that we have, some of the algorithms that we have uh, released, I think uh, DPAR uses C class instance, and that's what we uh, recommend because it does not really need that much of data. It's time series, uh, that much data in memory, but then it, need, it is very compute intensive. Now, as you move to deep learning, right? This is where you uh, pivot to deep learning. That's when you think about P family, right? Which is P3 instances. These are uh, NVIDIA's GPU instances uh, that provides you significant acceleration or uh, compute class instances. So the instance that we have, these are uh, really good instances for, of course, deep learning. A uh, lot of the AV customers, autonomous vehicle customers that I work with, uh, they love this P3 to 16x large uh, for a lot of the computer vision workloads. right? Uh, but these instances are good if you your deep learning model, of course, has to be, has to you leverage, you know, GPUs, because you have to enable use of GPUs in the in your model uh, training code, and uh, it, but it should get give you enough uh, acceleration. They 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 have they come at a cost. They are a little premium than you know all the other uh, instance types here, but then they will also accelerate your training significantly over you know other type of instances. The next class of instance is G family, which is uh, very recently introduced. Uh, these are next generation uh, uh, GPUs by Tesla. I mean, uh, uh, T4, T4 GPUs uh, by NVIDIA. Um, so these are smaller in size, but they can give you enough acceleration uh, in terms of training. Okay. Uh, mostly used for inference. These are sort of purpose-built for inference, but you can also use them for training. But you know, they, they are primarily built for inference, uh, running inference at lower cost. Now, uh, the other two instance types, like INF1 and Elastic Inference is a capability. Uh, INF1 is our new uh, native uh, sort of, uh, gen you know, native, uh, natively created chip. Uh, called Inferentia. The instance is based on the Inferentia chip, which is also used by, uh, you know, hypervisors that are built using a Nitro system. So that's uh, some guidance around what to use uh, for which type of workloads. So let's uh, let's think about. Okay. Yeah, let's let's talk through like you know what do you consider? What are some of the considerations when you select like a family? Type and then instance type, right? So the so we talked about different instance families: compute, memory optimized, GPU, you know, G class, or compute optimized, etc. So you have to optimize for time and cost. So let's say you are running a model, or you are training for a uh, training for a model which requires frequent training, right? Requires frequent training. So then your consideration may be time, right? You want to get that thing out early, and then you choose a little bit higher instance type, right? Instance family that will give you that boost. Now, if your consideration is cost, right? For example, if you're doing image classification where, you know, you're not getting like lot many images. Most likely these, you, have, you get a bunch of images and you're training the image classification model, and most likely you may not train that model again for some time, right? And then that's when you maybe pivot to, uh, pivot to cost, and then uh, rather than using a high-end GPU, uh, like you know, P3, uh, P3 24x large, or P3D and 24x large, you can maybe get by with a lower-end uh, GPU which may, the training may run longer, but then you, you will not incur as much cost. So that's the consideration you should give yourself. Then uh, when you have the model complexity is another one, right? But do I use a compute or, uh, or a GPU? So if you are using a deep learning, complex model, a lot of parameters, and then if 
it is enabled to leverage GPUs, right? Then you should think about GPU family. If it is, isn't enabled to leverage GPU, then you should not. Uh, sometimes there are algorithms that, uh, that uh, I had come across an algorithm, uh, ALS. Most likely you guys have used ALS. So ALS has a GPU enabled thing, but it could not use a multi-GPU. Even if you have multi-GPU, it was able to use only one GPU. So should you, do you have, do you want to use GPU? Because you know, then you're not really leveraging GPU that much. It'll mostly run on CPU. The, so that, that's the consideration for instance family. Then uh, next is instance size, right? How do you choose instance size? Now, again, we talked in the previous slide, if you, if you need more memory, then you use, uh, you use uh, memory optimize R, if you, and, and then you know, size it properly uh, because there is a memory to CPU ratio, and then similarly, uh, uh, compute optimized. Uh, again, uh, another uh, thing is, can your model really use multi-GPU, multi-GPU, right? So not every model, unless, the, unless you explicitly mention in the model to utilize multi-GPU, multi right, it will not leverage natively multi-GPUs. Again, there are frameworks like Horovod that we have uh, natively support, we natively support in uh, SageMaker that will allow you to leverage, you know, multi-GPU instances as well as distributed multi-GPUs, okay? So you need to consider whether your model uh, or training code really supports multi-GPU uh, model. Now the next consideration is how many instances, right? If your time is a factor, you wanna get this thing done faster, you should use instance count, right? No more distributed training. Again, if you use distributed training, uh, SageMaker is a really good uh, platform because it provides you two modes like parameter server as well as Horovod. These are two techniques we have uh, for uh, sort of distributing uh, your training jobs across multiple instances. I mean, we have a customer, uh, Mobileye, uh, who is in autonomous vehicle uh, space, and they are, they were able to train their jobs on 1,000 instances, uh, P3, 2X, 16X large instances for uh, one of their training jobs. So that is the kind of scale uh, we are talking about, and you can achieve that if time is a factor and you really want to get things done faster. So other consideration when you think about training is uh, pipe mode. I mean, I've added these slides very lately because I think uh, I need to call out. Um, so in SageMaker, we have this uh, purpose-built feature to make your training start faster called pipe mode, right? So traditionally, if you train uh, uh, machine learning, you download your data in uh, EBS attached volume and then you start your training. So if you are using a computer vision model, and a lot of, you have a lot of images, a lot of data in S3, it, you know that start time is, there is it, it's penalized because it will wait for that particular data to be downloaded and it does not start as fast. So th there are two charts here that where we show yellow and green, right? So yellow is the file mode where we download the data into uh, attach EBS storage and the pipe mode where we are streaming data from S3 and it is streamed uh, because machine learning typically or deep learning runs on batch of data, right? So you stream the data, a batch of data, maybe there are some certain shuffling functions available um, in memory and then, and then training starts as soon as those instances are launched, right? So you can see we did experiment on different type of instances. Uh, the first chart shows the job execution time so the file mode, uh, which is you know downloading data, is significantly higher than the pipe mode. And then uh, job startup time, which matters if you are using computer vision models on a lot of data, or even NLP models on a lot of data. So if you see, the job startup time is much, much lower in, uh, in the pipe mode, which is green color, than the file mode. So pipe mode is supported for uh, native containers within SageMaker automatically. It's just a flag that you have to set, and then pipe mode will be enabled. If you build custom container, we have a guidance how do you sort of uh, use it. Uh, it also works with uh, what we call a script mode, where you bring, bring your TensorFlow PyTorch script, and you, you will be still uh, able to use pipe mode without changing your code. 
So that's pipe mode. That is one purpose-built optimization. Uh, next is uh, distributed training. Uh, just want to call out that there are two modes. Uh, one is the parameter server, where you know you have a sort of a parameter server uh, attached to every worker, which uh, sort of takes the gradients, it uh, aggregates it, and then again distributes back. Right. So it's an asynchronous sort of distribution. And then second is Horaward, which was uh, developed by Uber, and now it's an open source project. So Horaward is sort of a leading uh, framework for distributed training nowadays, and it it works slightly different differently. It has the sort of a message passing interface or MPI, which is a popular standard for you know distributing your traffic across multiple nodes in a clustered environment. So again, uh, we support both, uh, but Horaward gives you significant significant bump if you are doing a distributed training. The 256 uh, instance training that I was talking about is using Horaward. Even the Mascar CNN uh, benchmarks that I showed in the first slide, they are also using Horaward. Okay? So, uh, oops. I'm sorry. Yeah, the third purpose built optimization for training is a uh, file system. So, traditionally, if you are using a uh, lot of data, right, for your training, then uh, it typically downloads, you know, the data gets downloaded into uh, from S3 into uh, attached EBS storage in SageMaker, and that's when training starts. Now, we have last year, or I'm sorry, earlier this year, we've added FSx for Luster and EFS support for our training clusters. So instead of hydrating the data, data from S3, you can directly upload that data into these file systems, and then that file system can be used as an input to a training cluster. So it significantly improves the time. Just think about hyperparameter tuning job, right? Which you have to do hyperparameter tuning jobs in SageMaker against you know, a data set which is very large. So in HPO, it'll, if you use a traditional mode, S3, it'll, every container will try to download that data, and then it'll, it'll start the training. So it'll, it'll give you a significant uh, penalty, but if you use EFS or FSx, instead of you know, using S3 as a source, it's going to significantly improve uh, your training time and reduce the time it takes for you know, hyperparameter optimization. So FSx for Luster is sort of a, it's, it's a very high throughput system used for a lot of simulation uh, systems in oil and gas, and as, because it's a high throughput file system. Um, and it, you can, FSX of Luster typically hydrates its data from S3, but then it does a sort of a lazy loading where you don't have to worry about you know, when it loads data, it, it just takes care of that on, on, on its own. Uh, on the other hand, EFS uh, is uh, you know, uh, another file system which, where you have to load the data first, and then it'll, it'll, it can be hydrated into uh, SageMaker training cluster. So these are two uh, purpose-built features that we have built for uh, folks who have a lot of data and they cannot wait for that tra training to start. So let's talk a little bit about you know, GPU instances, because if you are getting into deep learning, you got to know what, what are the different type of GPU instances available. So uh, showing you three, two examples, right? So P3DN is a, a latest addition. Uh, it's been available since last year, uh, but you know, we had released the support for P3DN in SageMaker, I think, uh, uh, just a few months ago. And it has been uh, a really good journey, because a lot of our customers in like uh, autonomous vehicle, uh, simulation oil and gas industries, or even in financial industry, uh, uh, love P3DN instance. And they have started adopting SageMaker just because of this instance family is available. So this particular instance has uh, 256 gig memory. If you use 24 uh, X large instance, it has eight Volta GPUs, uh, V100 GPUs. Then uh, it has 100 gigabits per second uh, network attached cards. It means when it is doing a sort of a, a data transfer or any of the distributed training, the, the, the speed is significantly increased for training. Now the second type of instance is GPU compute instance, which is G4 types. If you don't need, you know, those, because these P3 instances are expensive, and they give you more horsepower for GPUs, right? And more number of cores. 
the, the petaflops. It's one petaf, uh, petaflop. But if you look at G4, it, it is 520 teraflops. So if you don't really need that much of horsepower, then you should think about using G4 instances, okay? Uh, which will be significantly cheaper than uh, the, the P3 instances. Now let's uh, look at inference. Now we have done enough of training. So what are the basic differences of inference versus training, right? What are the characteristics? So if you look at inference, uh, or if you look at training, typically all the scientists are you know, looking at how do I make my training go faster, right? I mean, that is where science is moving. You know, you think about bird. I mean, there are so many variations of bird. I mean, everyone is sort of benchmarking over each other, right? Take one model, uh, like pre-trained model, and then benchmark again and again. So training is quite increasing. So there are a lot of efficient methods like Hor Award and parameter service. So you can like really increase the training, uh, reduce the training time by using the parallelism that GPU or uh, offers, right? Or multi-memory offers, multi-core uh, offers. Now, if you think about inference, uh, mainly the inference at real time, it is sometimes a lot of times it's single operations unless. You are, you are doing some sort of batch prediction, or you have multiple endpoints, or multiple applications hitting the same uh, GPU instance that is hosting your model. So typically, it's, so it means it cannot really utilize the entire available uh, horsepower to it. Second is, uh, you know, the training is very compute and, compute and memory intensive operation. It's batch, whereas, you know, inference isn't, right? It may be doing in one or two. Uh, prediction at times. Um, uh, training typically is sort of batch. You don't really have any business logic, right, in training. But sometimes if you host your models for inference, you may also couple that with business logic, right, which can happen. In SageMaker, of course, you don't do that. But if you host it outside within your application, you may host your application and then also load the model within that particular instance type. So always, you know, that, that, that's a variation. Uh, again, training typically runs in cloud because you can get the latest and greatest, but then inference need not always run in cloud, right? It can be on edge or you can take a model and go to on-prem and run on different device. And then training, you know, of course, it, it's sort of an ephemeral process. It's a batch, and then inference can run all the time. So these are just basic considerations and differences, uh, which are very obvious, actually. So uh, the outcome is, you know, majority of cost that uh, over the long period of time, if you look at it, it comes from inference. If you are using real-time prediction endpoints, I, I I was just uh, with a customer meeting where <laughs> I was uh, listening to a story about uh, someone created, you know, was doing an emergent day, and then they kept the instances running, and they incurred lot of costs. So, I mean, that's an example of, you know, how uh, real-time inference endpoints can cost you, whereas training doesn't. It, it, it shows in a short-term cycle, but you, you're not training as much, okay? So let's uh, do the same exercise that we did for training uh, for the inference. Uh, again, you see, for inference, of course, you can use those other families, but these are the primary families that you use for inference, right? You can use T, M, R, C for uh, hosting your inference and compute, uh, which is fine. But then we also have GPU and other uh, type of instances. Now, so, so P is for you know, accelerated computing, where you are leveraging GPU, and you need acceleration even during inference. So you can definitely use P. A lot of our computer vision mo models like SSD, single shot detection, semantic segmentation, uh, NLP like BERT, you know, they typically use you know P type instances. If you do not need that much, and, and when what you should do is probably look at you know the characteristics when you do the experiment. You know, host a model with P, and then you know if you you can always check for the GPU utilization. If you don't need it, then you can pivot to G family, uh, which is you know slightly it it is purpose built for inference not so much for training, and it will give you a better uh, price to cost ratio. Now, uh, INF1, that's a new uh, type of uh, instance that we have launched at reInvent. It is based on um, Inferentia chip uh, that we have been developing for some time. Uh, last year, I guess, uh, we released the hypervisors based on Nitro systems that use Inferentia. 
and then we release INF1 as an instance uh, purpose-built for inferences. Now, infer that instance is 3x times faster than uh, the G family instance based on our benchmark, and it gives you, it is at 40% of cost, right? It gives you, I'm sorry, it, it gives you 40% of cost. Yeah, that's right. So much, much uh, cost efficient. And then finally, if you really don't need any sort of entire GPU, uh, then we have a, a thing called elastic inference uh, that allows you to use slice of GPU. So before we uh, go into the elastic inference and other topics, let's look at these three type of instances that I was primarily talking about. So if you need lower latency and high throughput, inf1 is your instance, right? Um, it, it gives you better uh, sort of performance per price uh, ratio uh, against the G4. If you, your model requires GPU acceleration, then you should try using G4 because G4 gives you a better uh, performance at lower price. And there are some models that really require P3 or P3 DN, right? Like, for example, if you are using batch prediction where you can utilize all the, uh, you know, your entire GPU, then you should definitely use P3, P3 DN because it's going to give you a better uh, time at, you know, at, at probably very uh, similar price per time ratio. Um, so you should definitely think about P3. But I have not seen scenarios where P3 and P3 DN uh, really performs for real time predictions against G4. I mean, if you look at, I mean, it performs well because it has more uh, horsepower, but uh, there are very few use cases that really uh, makes that difference for the inference. Uh, quickly, you know, uh, infun instance comes in different form factors, right? Uh, uh, that that you can use. Uh, you should you should try it out. I'm gonna move on. Now let's talk about uh, GPUs, right? Uh, what are some of the knobs that uh, you can leverage to reduce the cost for inference? And this is something we have launched last year. So uh, the thought is, you know, when you use GPU for inference, you know, you're not your utilization is going to be low, right? And then, and then other thought is, if you are hosting your model along with your business logic, right? Most likely, if you use, you know, uh, you know, the, your business logic may need one type of instance versus your uh, m the model. Business code may need one type of instance, where your model may need another type of instance. So, th if you want to want them to coexist, you know, it's like one size does not fit all, right? Because you know, maybe your business logic is fine with T type instance, but your uh, your uh, model really needs GPU acceleration, right? So, so it, one size doesn't fit all. Um, again, there are two ways to, uh, you know, uh, customers deploy inference, right? One is you host the inference as an endpoint, uh, let's say in SageMaker, and then you have multiple applications hitting that endpoint, and, or you have a fleet of such, you know, uh, uh, inference endpoints, and then your applications are hitting it. So it, it sort of uh, resides on its own whereas your business logic is uh, on a separate instance. So that is one way to host. Second is you can co-locate uh, the application stack along with the inference. So you have that model hosted on the same instance where your application stack is. Sometimes you know we have customers who really need uh, like sub millisecond, I mean like a five, six millisecond latency. Uh, and that's when you know they want to co-host their business logic and the application uh, and the model in the same instance type. Okay, so there are two ways to host the inference. Now, so to sort of overcome that second mode, uh, we have sort of designed elastic inference, right? So, so elastic inference allows you to attach slice of GPU as a network accelerator to uh, a, C, a compute class instance. Okay, so it's a network interface, a slice of GPU attached to your compute class instance. Now, what it does is, if you uh, and we have done some benchmark with a customer when we launched it uh, called Autodesk. Uh, the benchmark showed us that if you use the slice of you know the GPU, the full scale GPU, 
Of course, you're going to get better acceleration because the GPU is local. But if you use elastic inference on a C-class instance, but you know, your elastic inference uh, is really a network accelerator, it means there is a latency. right? So, but when we did that math, we still found that there is still a 75% cost benefit versus just using a GPU. Of course, there is a price, uh, there is a performance penalty because it's not on local, it's, it's over network, right? And we use like high throughput network cards even though it's on network. Now, uh, the elastic inference comes in three sizes and depending on how much GPU acceleration you need, you use elastic inference. And I'm gonna talk about those three sizes. Elastic inference is available on, of course, EC2, EKS, uh, service, ECS service, and uh, SageMaker uh, also supports elastic inference, uh, which is a lot easier than spinning your own clusters and using uh, elastic inference for in, uh, uh, inference. Now, uh, we support TensorFlow, uh, you know, MXNet, and Onyxable framework. PyTorch support, which if you are using PyTorch, PyTorch support is coming very, very soon. Uh, we are also Build, uh, building other features like you know fleet of fleet of GPUs or you know multi size you know instead of having one accelerator attached to the uh, attached to the you know C cl compute class instance you can attach multiple accelerators so you can you know size up so currently you you have only three options but then you can even add more so you can add mix and match right similar to how uh, you can have multiple network interfaces to and compute instance, you can have multiple EI interfaces. And it comes with single and mixed precision operations. So that is also a, a key to increase performance. Now, when you are using elastic inference with SageMaker, uh, it is, uh, you can attach du during, the, during the prototyping, right, as you are building your algorithm in no SageMaker notebook, you can sort of when you launch a notebook, you can attach elastic inference, and there is a single parameter that you have to add when you are sort of locally hosting your, uh, you can locally host your uh, inference on the notebook itself through a local mode, and you add like a single parameter that says that, hey, use elastic inference. And what happens is, behind the scenes, we, we, we use the inference uh, and accelerate your uh, inference by using EI that is uh, attached to the notebook. So it's really good to see uh, during prototyping. So you can have a, a local mode serving, uh, serving mo model with and without elastic inference attached just by tweaking that parameter and then see if they, you get the performance gain or not, right? So depending on that uh, prototyping, when you deploy your model in production, all you have to do is provide the type of elastic inference uh, accelerator you need, and then we will uh, deploy that in the SageMaker uh, deployment instance. So it's, it's, a, it's just an API that allows you to leverage elastic inference. So elastic inference come in three sizes. Uh, so you know, medium, large, X large, and it has like a different uh, sort of uh, T-flops uh, with both single precision and mixed precision uh, throughput, and then some uh, memory. So as uh, when you decide, uh, let, let's talk about like how do you decide which type of uh, which type of EI accelerator you need. So so what is the right sizing, right? I mean, again, this comes uh, when you do prototyping. You should definitely do prototyping in POC before selecting you know what is the right size. i mean we can give you some guidance so let's say uh, so if you are using gpu memory right and if you can utilize the entire gpu then don't use ei use you know if you are using g4 instance then and you are using effectively all the memory just use instance type don't use ei but if you can't use the uh, all the effective memory uh, all the effective gpu uh, utilization, then you should definitely use uh, EI, right? So that's the guidance. Now, if target latency is important, right? You need lower latency, then use, you know, the uh, INF1 or G4 instances. Don't use EI because then EI will add certain latency to your, uh, you know, to your uh, prediction operation. If throughput is required, 
right? Throughput is required, then maybe use a, a better size GPU. Don't use, you know, you don't use e G I E I, because uh, you know E I is all of the network, and you know you may not get as much a bump uh, with with the acceleration against you know uh, the E I. But again, it'll come at a cost, right? If you don't use E I, it'll come at a cost. But for throughput, consideration should be you know use use uh, instance and not E I. Now, if you have a custom CUDA code or you have, you know, your own custom operators, EI today does not support, you know, that kind of uh, custom operators or custom CUDA code or custom TensorRT. So use instances than uh, custom operators or uh, than, than EI. Then other considerations is, of course, you know, very general, start small and expand from there. But then best thing is to do a POC to understand what are the performance characteristics uh, that you're getting based on your model. Because again, it really depends on your model, uh, the kind of throughput you need, and kind of EI that you need, the slice of GPU you need. Okay, so let's move on to another optimization that we offer for the inference called Sage Mechanio. So, uh, I think I should low on battery. So uh, the way Sage Mechanio works is, uh, so typically if you think about uh, model optimization, right? I mean, there are techniques like TensorRT and other, you know, open uh, TVM kind of uh, compilers available in the market. So typically, uh, so these compilers are either very, uh, sort of, so, uh, very sort of framework specific or they are hardware specific. There isn't a single compiler that really matches, you know, all type of uh, frameworks with all types of hardware, right? So that's the problem we are trying to solve with Sage Mechanio. So idea is train once your model in, you know, cloud and then deploy it anywhere on cloud or at edge. So it's, the concept is very simple. It, uh, you know, you, you have a target model in MXNet, TensorFlow, or uh, PyTorch, or then uh, you make a, a compile API call, select the model artifact location, and select the target hardware. What we do is when the, uh, the compiler is launched, we convert that uh, MXNet or Tensor, the model into a uh, framework agnostic format, you know, remove certain layers, compress the, compress the model up to one-tenth, and then convert into a binary depending on your target hardware architecture. Now, when you run that model on a target hardware architecture, all you do is install, you, sh you need to have a uh, SageMaker Neo runtime installer uh, installed on the target har hardware, S similar to how JVM is, it's a TVM architecture. And then all you do is host that binary on that particular runtime, and then it'll, it'll, provide, you the uh, it'll provide you the inference capability. So uh, recently, uh, I mean, we support all the major hardware providers that are out there in market, and they are in IoT business. But then recently, we have added uh, Texas Instruments, uh, a new type of processor, Citara, uh, and now we support SageMaker Neo in, on that particular platform. So quickly uh, recapping, uh, so Neo provides you same or better uh, performance for the prediction. It does automatic op optimization using deep learning techniques. And then it is supported for different leading frameworks. And there are many uh, uh, hardware vendors that are available uh, for target binary. Then it also reduces your uh, size up to 110%. So if you are using an edge device, you know, a traditional way of hosting the uh, inference endpoint is you know, having to install TensorFlow container, uh, which is really you know <laughs> huge, and then you host your uh, host your model. But with SageMaker Neo, you don't really have to install you know that container. It it strips out all the TensorFlow I mean the framework specific code, but then runtime provides you that runnable uh, runnable capability, and uh, you can host your model, which is a smaller binary than the model model would be. So why run inference at edge? Right, so there are many use cases, and which again are very sort of commonplace, right? In industrial IoT use case, you know, any video analytics use case in the store, 
you know, drones. So all these inferences typically happen at the edge. You know, you cannot really go to cloud. You know, there are laws of physics, right? You want to take that action instantly. So that's where you use, uh, you know, uh, the inference at edge. So, and this is where SageMaker Neo definitely helps you because then it is, you don't have to worry about, you know, how do you host your model and what do you build on your target hardware. It, you know, all you do is install that uh, runtime, Neo runtime, and it's, it's available. So this example shows a pipeline uh, where you have image data, you build and train using SageMaker, you know, you have a trained model artifact in S3, right? And then you use, you know, and th there is a camera that's sort of uh, running, you know, Texas Instruments uh, Citara processor, and you use the, you know, use your own infrastructure to download that model, uh, the, the SageMaker Neo compiled binary onto the camera, and then it, it will provide you inference capability. So this is one use case, slightly manual. But then we also have this uh, service called IoT Greengrass. Uh, if you're sort of massively uh, want to deploy these uh, compiled binaries onto different you know, IoT devices, then I definitely recommend using IoT Greengrass. Similar pipeline, but the model deployment uh, push uh, happens through IoT Greengrass, uh, uh, you know, IoT service, which is uh, AWS IoT. So just uh, just to summarize, just to summarize, uh, again, this is a certification slide. So just summary is, you know, use the for training, use the right instance and family. Uh, use distributed training, use streaming capability, use EFS FSX, you know, if it speeds up your training. For inference, use, you know, elastic inference for you know to to reduce the cost for inference. Right size your instance in one for you know a better uh, lower latency or G4 to get you know uh, for lower cost, and uh, use SageMaker Neo if you have IoT use case to compile your model to a target hard hardware architecture. Again, this slide if you are I mean most of you are data scientists so this may not mean much, but if you are trying to get into get more into data science then we also have this. Uh, AWS Machine Learning University, which is now open source. I mean, it's available, and you can choose your path, and uh, it'll provide you all the curriculum. We also have machine learning specialty certification. Uh, that does not really, it gives you a lot of street credentials. I mean, if you're a data scientist, it, it probably teaches you about you know our services. But then if you're new into it, then I would definitely recommend taking that specialty certification. <coughs> 